Welcome back to World War Now, everybody. I am your host, Conrad Franz, joined as always by Dmitry Kalyagin. We have a great show for you this week, episode 67. It's been a big week of news. We are fresh off Vucic's speech. We are anticipating a possible escalation, maybe even a new front in a war in the Balkans. Of course, he was discussing Kosovo, Srpska, Milorad Dodik, the president of Srpska, has been threatened with violence and arrest and use of force against him. Uh, by Bosnian authorities and whatnot. It's really heating up there. Of course, we're also going to talk about the imminent Rafah operation, where it appears the U.S. has approved of Israel about to go in, and then after that, apparently, they're going to head right on up into Lebanon. So the Israel front, Holy Land front, is rapidly expanding. We're going to also talk about the Red Heifers and their potential imminent sacrifice overlooking the Temple Mount and the Dome of the Rock and how this could escalate You know the eschatological implications of this whole conflict. We're going to talk about the front line in Ukraine, how Russia is about to launch one of the biggest offensives since February 2022, as well as Lavrov's comments and some other things that have been going on there. We're going to talk about Crocus, you know, some more things that we've learned since the big terrorist attack. We're going to talk about all of that and much more. So it's going to be a very jam-packed show. Dimitri, how are you doing? Doing, you know, doing good myself and of course just taking in all of the news and the stories from the past week or shall we say even eight days time. It's really been a lot to consume and a lot to sort of digest, get our mind around. But first and foremost, like just recently in the last 48 hours, some of the developments around both Respublika Serbska, the sort of one third, 33% size entity of Bosnia Herzegovina. It's a Serbian sort of autonomous republic, which we spoke about quite a bit. Um, it has a lot of autonomy in, it, in and of itself. And Milorad Dodic, its president at the moment, is facing essentially um, almost like threatening uh, threatening actions and threats from the official Bosnian Islamic authorities personally. It's not just he's facing sort of some sort of censorship or sanctions, but they're trying to tell him that if you start any sort of domestic disputes in Bosnia-Herzegovina, your life may be at risk. And they're currently, allegedly, there's stories out at the moment. It says there's, there are rapid reaction forces whose task is to arrest Milorad Dodik, who are trying to reach him. But of course, he has his own bodyguards protecting him. There's Definitely a lot of things taking place just north of Serbia in some of its, uh, I would say, more ancient and sort of uh, ancient sort of fiefdoms that once belonged to the Serbian people in the Republic of Serbska. And at the same time, Milorad Dodic, his partner in, I don't want to say partner in crime, but partner in great things, Alexander Vucic, who, you know, we've called the cock of Kosovo for a little while, but perhaps this is his enlightenment and comeback moment, which we spoke about last week. Uh, Alexander Vucic has given a very powerful speech regarding Kosovo, regarding the situation, the oppression of the Serbian people in that artificial native created region uh, just south of Serbia. So again, Serbia is kind of being split between two poles of influence here. They're focusing on Kosovo. They're also focusing on Respublika Srpska at the same time. And this is all coming to sort of into fruition as NATO increases its troop supplies as it's powering up some of its eastern bases in Romania, Poland, and in the Baltic. So it's quite interesting that Serbia and Vucic in particular is gaining all this, I guess, powerful reassurance in and of himself and maybe his generals are advising him that now's a good time to possibly make something happen considering the fact that nato is really active at the moment they do have you know some of their planes are fueled up ready to go they have scouting planes and drones flying all over the black sea region it really isn't um you know a, di a fair distance away from serbia itself and we've seen how in the 1990s even during the feast day of easter serbia was bombed by these nato criminals in the past so it really is uh it really is raising some questions, right? So who exactly is reassuring Vucic now, now, that now is the time to act and now is the time to make these powerful rhetoric, rhetorical statements in favor of, you know, I guess, Serbian supremacy over some of these formerly Serbian regions, which were taken away from them, you know, through Ottoman imperial genocide, as well as through some of the actions of NATO and even the communist regime, which ruled Serbia and essentially, ex, uh, you know, brought in and imported a bunch of Muslims from Albania into Kosovo. Like Kosovo itself is the heartland of the Serbian Orthodox people. We know this, you can actually see it archeologically. The, the monasteries, in fact, are not even archeological objects. They're still open and still functioning on its land, but Kosovo is 90 plus percent Muslim at the moment. So the land is essentially, I don't want to say occupied, but it's definitely settled at the moment artificially by all of these Islamic settlers and the Serbian people do want to find out exactly how they can take this land back legally, maybe with as little blood spill as possible, because this is one of these historical Christian reconquistas which still need to take place. So again, the, all eyes are on Vucic, but I'm just curious, Conrad, like why is he so brave? And some of these quotes that he's you know, throwing out there, at least today in the last 24 hours, is so powerful. It's both inspirational and scary because, well, we all know what happened the last time NATO really faced off against Serbia. These people are ruthless and they're intolerant of any sort of Christian Orthodox uprising in the Balkans. 
Yeah, Vucic is talking about how, you know, the Serbs are done being embarrassed. You know, they want to humiliate us. It's not going to happen again. There's a cultural genocide of Serbs happening in Kosovo. You know, he said, I've noticed that they do not like the idea of Serbian troops returning to Kosovo, but every other army apparently can come to Kosovo, Croatia, Montenegro, etc. You know, he made some pretty dramatic statements. So, we will fight. We're small. All these powers are against us, but we will fight. They are bringing us to an impossible geopolitical situation. I believe that Serbia's reaction should be strong and responsible on May 11th. And this is all in response to the Council of Europe is talking about having a vote in April on Kosovo's entrance into the Council of Europe, which is one of the biggest steps into entering the European Union as a whole. Kosovo has talked about only implementing some of their agreements, such as you know Serbian municipal autonomy, uh, they still are talking about banning the Serbian dinar, all these other things. They're even only going to implement some of the things they agreed on, they say, once they're in the Council of Europe. So all of these things are deemed unacceptable by by Serbia and by Vucic. And again, Vucic is off of his big election victory, so he was able to avoid what some see as a potential color revolution. So he feels probably more secure than he has in a while. Elections are long, far away for him, so he's able to do all of this, but it wasn't just Kosovo that he talked about in the address. Like you said, he talks about, you know, Srpska. He says Srpska has a right to exist per the Dayton Agreement and no one can dissolve it. You know, he's met with Dodik. They are very close and everything like that. The Patriarch meets with both of them somewhat frequently. And Dodik, I mean, he was making even stronger statements, obviously. He said, you know, they're threatening me with arrest and I received information that told me that if my security guards resist, they'll shoot me. I told them that we will resist. You know, so he's, you know, basically declaring war on on the Bosnian authorities, they passed an election law that the Srpska National Assembly totally voted to reject, and they said that if they don't make changes to the law, they're going to pass their own election law. So this is just, it's just very incremental steps into Srpska secession, which doesn't really necessarily need to overtly happen because it basically has already happened. I mean, there have even been border standoffs between Bosnia and Srpska. And of course, Christian Schmidt, who's, you know, the high authority in Bosnia, is still a you know, a German person, they're still overseeing this transition. Bosnia isn't really a, it's not a real country by any stretch of the imagination, but it's still not even capable of governing itself according to, you know, the European standards that are trying to integrate it into the system. And they are threatening Dodik, they're assisting him. Like you said, there are planes, American and NATO planes flying over Srpska, over Kosovo, over all of these regions, while the Serbian border forces are, you know, very close to the Kosovo border and whatnot. Unfortunately, who knows what we'd be seeing if Serbia hadn't been so disarmed in the aftermath of its defeats in the 90s and whatnot. But the Serbian military is unfortunately much smaller than it could or maybe should be. So I don't know if the Serbs are able to do everything that they will need to do to reclaim all of their interests, let alone go somewhere maybe like Montenegro and do what needs to be done without, frankly, what seems to me, Russian support. You know, that seems to be the necessary ingredient. And I don't want to skip over to Russia just yet. We'll talk about that in a minute. But I don't know, Dimitri. I mean, the Russians don't seem capable of helping the Serbs. They don't even have, you know, a land connection to get them weapons or whatever it is they would need. So this is quite interesting. I don't know exactly where Vucic is going to go with this after, you know, some of his timelines seem to be coinciding with what Lavrov is talking about. And even in his speech, he mentions that the Western powers are afraid of the imminent defeats in Ukraine and that it's becoming unpredictable and they don't know what's going to happen. So perhaps he's really kind of subtly hitching his wagon to the Russian side, hoping that they could help him as they succeed in Ukraine. You know, at this point, anything could happen, it seems. Yeah, that's right. And, you know, just recently, again, in the last 24 hours, in this, in the last days of March 2024, China has officially invited Serbia to join it for the 2024 BRICS summit taking place this year. Again, Serbia possibly, you know, seeking membership in the BRICS economic group, which would be really, I think, beneficial considering that Doge, um, Considering that Vucic officially has stated that, look, he's not interested in European integration, he's not interested in NATO, uh, unlike some of his other Orthodox Christian neighbors, such as Romania, Bulgaria, and Greece, who have, of course, aligned themselves a lot closer with some of these more uh, Western-inspired uh, you know, forces in Europe, unfortunately. And you know those, those economic benefits, of course, come with a price, and they come with cultural Westernization, liberalization, which we saw and spoke about 
uh, regarding Greece, unfortunately. And you know, it's happening in Romania as well and Bulgaria very slowly, but uh, eventually they'll also get there and they will be sort of enriched by some of these negative traits that we see taking place in those countries like Greece, of course, and possibly Georgia in the future. Again, it's just a really negative sort of scenario that the that the proposal is, is being given. They're saying, look, it's either you economic prosperity and liberal cultural degeneracy or there's no prosperity and no degeneracy and again maybe sometimes you have to sacrifice you know prosperity such as belarus itself like the belarus people the belarusian people don't live very richly but they do live in quite moral and ethical frameworks in all of europe you know the country is quite isolated in terms of its relations with its neighbors but the belarusian people live honestly they they, they work really hard yeah they don't make a lot of money but at the same time it's it's just a sort of really honest hard-working eastern european lifestyle which maybe some people do need and want because again the prices are quite low low there as well so perhaps that's something that awaits serbia in the short to medium term now the thing is i'm not sure what serbian zoomers and the younger population are really looking forward to i don't think all of them especially the liberal the young liberals and which exist in almost every society at this, at this moment are really inspired by this sort of serbian revengeism but again it's just about ignoring what the youth think especially if the youth are mostly liberal and they don't really understand what's at stake here and this at the and what's at stake is essentially serbian future existence right it's the existence of serbia its culture its country a country which is already shattered into pieces serbia serbia historically should be consisted of kosovo montenegro serbia which we see today in bosnia uh in bosnia the Republic of serbska these four parts in combination together are actually what serbia is historically as an entity and of course montenegro i think is worth mentioning too because montenegro really kind of aligns it really answers the questions as to where does the church stand in terms of some of these kosovo questions and Republika Srpska questions and whether the patriarch stand on all these issues the patriarch of serbia and belgrade well in montenegro we saw the nato of course the nato aligned uh, Montenegrin government essentially openly attempt to create a schism within the Montenegro local autonomous church and actually pull people just like Epiphany and the EP tried to do in Ukraine, pull the people into a schism. So essentially create a mirror church in Montenegro. Unfortunately enough, the metropolitan of Cicinje and Montenegro, he was actually quite a holy man. So he stopped that from taking place during the early months of COVID. And eventually he passed away in that same year of 2020, which you know was a great loss. But he kind of, with his last breath of life, he actually saved his entire region from schism. So he's quite a holy man, I think, and he's venerated to this day. But we should just consider, and I'm speaking about Amphilochia here, we should just consider that Serbia is, again, between a rock and a hard place, right? You said... How can Russia really assist that Russia at the moment is being bombed in Belgrade? Russia's being pressured internally through domestic terror acts. Russia, again, is looking for maybe a local push. How can Russia assist and get past some of these massive obstacles, one of which is that primary Romanian sort of blockade? The Romania is threatening Transnistria. Romania and Moldova are working together to sort of kind of cause this Transnistrian issue. All of these questions remain unanswered. And Russia is very, very far away. And the Black Sea is not a safe place for Russia. We've seen the Black Sea fleet threatened a bunch of times. How can Russia reach Serbia in time to assist it against this potential NATO threat if Serbia makes a move? Uh, huge questions. But, you know, Milorad Dodik, he did visit Belarus and Russia recently. So perhaps there was some conversations there and perhaps he passed on some information to Vucic, which would be probably top secret. But maybe there are plans, there are contingencies in place, and maybe NATO isn't as powerful as we fear it may be at this moment, because again, the teeth and the nails and the claws are out, but perhaps uh, the beast is not as ferocious as we may fear it is. We're going to be watching the situation in the Balkans closely. We always are. You mentioned Anfrilochie and the whole situation amidst, you know, the COVID and everything. You know, they were trying to pass that law that would confiscate basically all of the autonomous church of montenegro that was you know under the serbian orthodox church and give it to the state and they would then in turn have basically given some of it to this totally fake schismatic church that was recognized by nobody that was openly a total meme like the head of it openly worshipped milo jukanovic like almost like a saint like he had pictures of him all over his office it was extremely weird even though he was you know still alive and serving as the dictator of montenegro who is now no longer in power thank goodness after so long and you know, so it's one of those things where Montenegro politically was able to, again, I don't want to say influenced it back into the Serbian world, but, you know, it basically reverted from its older Maidan status to a more neutral country in the region. And now we're seeing, you know, the Western powers kind of attempting to pull Kosovo and Srpska fully away from the Serbian world before Serbia is able to do anything. So Vucic, I think, perceives this as kind of his last chance to really secure any of these things, or he's going to go down in history as the president of Serbia that lost 
you know, most of the Serbian world ultimately forever to the West, which I don't know how many Serbs think of it as inevitable regarding Kosovo and all of these sorts of things. I know it's like at least a quarter of the country supports, you know, an armed operation to retake Kosovo. So that's fairly significant. You mentioned Serbian Zoomers. I don't know too much, but I have seen videos of Serbian Zoomers just walking down the street and just taking down pride flags and throwing them in the trash. So some of the, and we obviously know that we've seen, you know, the homophobic wizards and other firework gang denizens that show up at the Belgrade pride marches and assault the, the homosexuals trying to pervert the children there. So it's the Serbs, you know, they're stronger than many, but at the same time, like you said, Dimitri, they're strong ally, the Russians who have come to their aid in many a dire hour it seems that this may be one of those times when they may really not be able to do that no matter how much they may like it, you know. Maybe it'd be more realistic if they reconnected with Transnistria, you know, maybe in nine months from now when they've perhaps taken Odessa or some of these other things that could happen in the more near future. But again, it, it seems like right now, I mean, at the same time, you could say the same thing about NATO. Perhaps they're too stretched thin and Vucic is trying to take advantage of that. But unfortunately, if they are going to rely on Russian assistance, that's not something that can be relied upon right now. But unless you have anything else to say about Serbia, the Balkans and whatnot, I think the situation in Russia is quite relevant to that front because we heard Lavrov say that everybody needs to be watching Ukraine after May 20th, as we know Zelensky, you know, canceled elections. So I'm curious to your thoughts about Lavrov, what might be coming, you know, May 21st, as he said, what was he alluding to? Well, I think now that we understand Zelensky has officially taken upon himself this ancient Roman dictatorial status, it's really weird coming from a person of Talmudic Yiddish background that he's become this temporary dictator of Rome in like a Caesar slash Pompey fashion where he's like, well, I'm going to rule Ukraine with a strong hand while we're in this military crisis, right? Just like the ancient dictators against uh, when Rome was fighting against the Phoenicians and Carthage. But in this bizarre scenario, Zelensky canceling the elections of May 2024 really brings around this query of Russia. Russia is really obsessed with international law and legitimacy. Do you recall one of Russia's main mistakes in 2014 and 15 was actually not protesting the election of Poroshenko slash Valtz Weizmann or Waltzman, or Poroshenko, of course, is of Yiddish roots himself, as many a you know many a reporter and a hero of Donbass has spoken about. But Poroshenko was seen as a legitimate president of Ukraine, unfortunately, by Russia, and acknowledged as such. And so any of any sort of moves past Minsk one and two was seen as kind of uh, breaches of international sort of law and maybe even unlawful actions by Russia. And and thus Russia hasn't really done anything of strength in Ukraine until the SMO of 2022. So considering that Zelensky suddenly is not you know a dictator and Russia can call him that in sort of the eyes of the the eyes of the public there's no election he's just holding power past his like four year tenureship perhaps Putin and his administration the United Russia party including Lavrov could actually use this as a sort of uh, as leverage against Zelensky and his government maybe uh, maybe other countries which are still holding on to this weird idea of oh, we have to be democratic we have to rely on elections such as China India and all the other BRICS members perhaps they could also use that on an international arena and just say look Zelensky isn't the legitimate president Russia needs to move in and actually secure this area you know for peaceful negotiations and things like that and remember Erdogan as well there's these figures who rely on democratic elections to stay relevant so I think Lavrov was alluding to the fact that once this Easter period of you know middle of May kind of passes and once we're past this few weeks after Easter when the Zelensky election ought to take place then perhaps we can move in and actually solidify that with some sort of authority even past the you know past these sort of weird slogans of denazification which I'm not even sure what that means at this point right and maybe take some territory for real this time you know we're looking at again the military analysts have reported over the last two weeks that Russia is looking at the three main targets and we're not sure Ukraine isn't even sure which target Russia is going to strike it's either Odessa the city of Zaporozhye or the city of Kharkov Kharkov has been bombed in very intensely over the last I would say week ever since this terrorist act it's Krokus City Hall and on the outskirts of Moscow the unfortunate terrorist act which was blamed again on Ukraine and the CIA very directly by the head of the FSB Bortnikov as well as Putin and it's already been kind of claimed that U Ukraine and the CIA are behind this and so thus Kharkov which is one of the main I suppose bases of right sector and some of these other Banderite neo-Nazi organizations it can be struck very powerfully especially the outskirts of Kharkov which are, you know have these military formations stationed there and Kharkov has been of course one of the vanguard cities of the Ukrainian opposition to Russia for quite some time now and that's unfortunate because Kharkov historically is one of the more 
It's, it's a classical Russian imperial city. It's one of the most Russian and pro-Russian cities in all of Ukraine. It's essentially it was born during the reign of Catherine the Great, and it's existed ever since as one of these like just classical Russian towns, just not, no different to Belgorod and Bryansk. And so going forward, I think we'll be seeing a Russian strike on one, one of these three directions, but not kind of getting away from the main point. Lavrov's comments could also be solidified by some of the interesting interesting statements from like a Russian RT journalist. I'm not sure if he's former RT or he definitely was former RT. I'm not sure if he's still part of Russia today, but he's openly stated that Zelensky is a very bizarre Jewish man who hires Islamic terrorists to cause his, you know, to cause these terrorist acts in Krokus City Hall and things like that. So there are these allusions to, well, Zelensky is not a real Ukrainian. He's, you know, he's of Jewish descent. And again, Peskov as well, the secretary, the press secretary of the Kremlin officially stated that Zelensky is a very pe peculiar Jew a Jew who in many ways shows sympathy and gravitates towards the nationalist spirit and that has permeated the leadership of the Kiev regime. So we have Peskov saying something based for once, which is a relief because Peskov, a lot of, again, he posts a lot of coal, he posts a lot of questioning things online. He usually makes statements as the voice of Putin, but in fact, I think he's voicing his own, the opinions of his own twisted mind at times. And here we have him pointing towards the fact that Zelensky is not an ethnic Ukrainian. He does not represent the views of the Ukrainian nation. In fact, it's kind of like a leech. He subjugated the people. And in many ways, that's true. I mean, the Kabad runs Zelensky through Kolomoisky and some of these other massive rabbis who run Ukraine and have run it since for the last, I would say, 100 years since uh, the 1917 revolution. So there's a lot of consideration, I think, being given to the fact that Zelensky could be this throwaway pawn that could lose all of its remaining legitimacy after May of this year. And this could coincide with a possible summer offensive from the Russian side. And by summer, we mean European summer of June, July, and August. So we're definitely on track, I think, for a new Russian, for new Russian achievements, looking past Avdeevka, sort of strong pushes towards some of these major Ukrainian cities. I think that's a really good point. I think we could easily see Russia just radically enforce democracy, you know, as with the, as we saw their fair elections occurred, they've really asserted themselves as worldwide defenders of democracy. So at 12.01 a.m., you know, on, on May 21st, they may just have to completely blow Zelensky up with a missile for the good of worldwide democracy. Like, that may just be what has to happen. And that's may, that may be what we wake up to. You know, they say nothing's off the table. If they're really blaming Ukraine and the CIA for the Crocus attack, you know, they've pledged a pretty strong response. We're going to have to see that. They're going to have to live up to some of those words unless they want to look a little bit ridiculous. Of course, we heard the whole discourse around the death penalty and all of that, how Putin perhaps doesn't want the killers to be given the death penalty. However, many are saying that because Belarusian citizens were killed in the attack, that they could be sent to Belarus, which is the only country in Europe that still maintains the death penalty. So maybe Lukashenko saves the day once again, as far as the public is concerned. But we'll maybe get to that in a little bit. But as far as the Russian escalation goes, we've seen the Kazakhstan embassy in Ukraine warn its nationals in the Odessa and Kharkov regions to evacuate immediately. I assume they would say the same for the Zaporozhye region if they hadn't already said that. I assume anybody that was vacationing or doing business there before any kind of war broke out has left at this point. It's one of the major hot points along the front line, but it appears that certain Places that may be more in the know in the Russo sphere are asking their nationals to leave the region so we can expect some advances. Zelensky himself said he expects Russian advances at the end of May, at the beginning of June. So we'll see how all of this lines up. Perhaps we may see a bit of a shift from the attritional, you know, Clausewitzian strategy we've seen so far. We may finally see a bit more of a you know, a, a rapid advance forward and some even attempts to get some cities to fall with an initial overwhelming strike that many accuse the Russians of having tried to do at Kiev, you know, at the very beginning of the war that they claim failed. You know, there's disputes about what the actual objective on a lot of these operations was, of course, but we're going to be watching all of that very closely because, like Dmitry said, Kharkov, historically one of the most Russian cities in all of Ukraine, of course, the most radical right-wing pro-Ukrainian identity, you know, Jewish-backed, quote-unquote, neo-Nazi groups rose up there because they were able to kind of fight so strongly with the pro-Russians, you know, the radicals on both sides, as it were, were adjacent to each other, which, you know, that's how those things kind of work. And even to this day, of course, we know that the first successful and really only successful Ukrainian counteroffensive retook, you know, Izium and some of these other places that Russia had taken in the Kharkov Oblast. And right now, there's really only seven or eight villages in one town that are still occupied by Russia in the Kharkov 
region. But, you know, they did vote in the Russian elections. There were polling stations in all of those cities, despite them all being frontline cities. So as far as we can tell, Russia is committed to integrating Kharkov, if le at least part of it, into Russia. And I'm still not convinced that they're going to be dividing these oblasts down new lines. You know what I mean? I don't see Kherson or Zaporozhye being cut in half and then this war ending and that being the final integration. So in theory, the same thing goes for Kharkov, which has a Russian government, which is occupied, which has a military civilian administration, technically operational, even though it's only over a few towns. So we have to keep an eye on all of that. The same with Transnistria, which did have a lot of polling stations in the Russian election, because of course, I think over half of the civilians there are also Russian citizens. So all of these things point towards a very specific direction regarding Russian advancement and the ultimate regional gains that Russia is going to make. And again, I've made the points in the past that it could even be more than they even expect. But I think Lavrov is specifically talking about some strikes that we may be seeing on Ukrainian leadership come you know, this date that passes that Russia views, I guess, is internationally delegitimizing. So there goes the Russian, the Russian lawyering again, really focusing on international law. But Dmitry, I don't know if you have anything else to say about the situation in Ukraine and the front line. Like you said, those three cities and directions are really where the Russians are going to be pushing at this point. I guess there is the possibility that the Belarusians truly get involved. But we saw Lukashenko at his recent meeting with his dog present, he was he seemed more focused on the corridor towards Kaliningrad and dealing with the Baltic countries, which I don't know if he was just kind of saying that to, to make a show and be dramatic like he tends to, but, you know, he seems to maybe wanting to bring Belarus into play, broadly speaking. Yeah, of course, um, the Belarusian angle still hasn't changed. We know that Ukraine is keeping at least 100,000 of its troops, which is, by the way, 100,000 is the size of the entire Serbian military. Just an FYI, it's like a large number of troops, uh, east, you know, in terms of Eastern European numbers. It's keeping 100,000 troops on that northern, north of Kiev, sort of adjacent to the Belarusian border in case Lukashenko and Wagner, which there is a Wagner base in Belarus now, ever make a move down south and sort of strike at Kiev from that northern angle, which, again, they're not that far from the capital of Ukraine and Zelensky's headquarters and Budanov's headquarters. So that's kind of an interesting potential scenario. The other, of course, scenario that Lukashenko could always take is he keeps mentioning the Suwalki Gap, which separates Belarus, which is Belarus is a very closely allied state with Russia, as we all know, and Kaliningrad, which, yeah, again, Konigsberg, that sort of Russian island between Germany, Poland, and the Baltic states over there, sort of adjacent to the Baltic Sea. And, you know, that I think is a really, is a really strong objective that, you know, Lukashenko keeps mentioning because I think it's part of that alliance that deal that he has with Vladimir Putin and the United Russia Party that if things really do escalate to a certain point Lukashenko and Wagner will secure that Suwalki pass in order for Kaliningrad and its people to have a direct sort of in case they ever need to leave or there is a nuclear threat or, if, or anything of that sort if there's major military action uh, the Russian military can supply its forces in Kaliningrad through that Suwalki pass that Suwalki gap um through Belarus. So I think that's that's his kind of his mission. That's why he keeps mentioning it because it's kind of like a mission statement. It's been given to him, this objective, and Lukashenko's uh, you know, standing by he's standing by his words, especially in this hour of massive betrayal, which we're seeing in world politics. And I think he's sticking to his word. He understands that, you know, the the end is the end is near, like in terms of eschatologically and in terms of like this particular unraveling that we're seeing of World War III. It's, it's about to begin very soon. This, the end of peace is quite near, and so Belarus wants to be on the right side of history. Now, of course, looking at Odessa and the Black, you know, the Black Sea Fleet would need to be involved in that particular action if Russia was able to strike at cities such as Odessa and Nikolaev and secure some of that um, southern Ukrainian coastline, which is really key for grain exports. You know, We mentioned the threat of famine. We see famine currently in Gaza, Palestine, so we actually know what famine looks like in the modern context where people have iPhones, they have charging devices. You can film people starving to get to death in real time in HD and post it online, but yet you don't have any food to actually feed. Like It's insane, right? There is this dystopian future that we're looking at if a World War III breaks out, when, when, and when it will, there will be these cases in countries unfortunately probably cases in countries like africa like ethiopia where there won't be enough food for populations and people will be unfortunately dying from starvation it's just horrible and this is unfortunately something that may take place but looking at the russian black sea fleet the ukraine ukrainian uh, news agencies have announced that they've destroyed a third of it so 33 40 percent of the black sea fleet has officially been disabled and destroyed and ukraine is really boasting about that some sort of achievement but we need to consider the russian fleet that is currently again 
its ships have moved around from the Baltic Sea and some of it through the Black Sea, Russian ships have arrived in, in the Southern Red Sea zone. And the question may be, well, are Russians here to fight Houthis? Are they here to participate in Operation Prosperity Guardian? I think, Conrad, the reality is the Russian ships in the Red Sea, the, Russian, the ships of the Russian Navy, are there to operate and defend the Russian shipping lanes. And, you know, the, sh the international shipping lanes and specifically Russian ships which are passing because Russian, the Russian economy at the moment is in a very delicate state. As we may know, there's, there are a lot of, there are like 15,000 plus sanctions on the Russian Federation and it needs to really keep all of its imports and exports really tight. And there, there are no ships that can be taken out. I mean, th these would cause dramatic changes in the Russian uh, internal markets. So these Russian naval ships are essentially there just in case there's, there are no Black Swan events. There's no weird Israeli ships taking and harassing Russian Russian sailors, things like that. I think it's mostly commercial interest there. It's not like Russia is now finally siding with Israel against the Houthis. I don't think that's a scenario, no matter how somebody would paint that in the media. So generally speaking, it's probably a pro-Russian move by having the Navy there. And also it secures um, secures these, uh, you know, I guess, NATO Western-sided Israeli naval forces and whoever is participating in Operation Prosperity Guardian from targeting countries like Ethiopia in case it ever gets involved in Eritrea and some of these other countries. So having a Russian Navy there, again, secures, I think, confidence in both the Houthis, the Iranians and the Ethiopians that, look, we have an allied Christian nation participating in this part of the sea. And if, if things ever escalate into a World War III scenario, we'll have their backing. Well, I think we mentioned on a previous episode that China and Russia had entered into a dialogue with Ansar Allah, the Houthis, about perhaps giving them international support or recognition in exchange for allowing their ships to pass unmolested. And as far as we could tell, that never really went anywhere. And we heard reports of Russian ships having near misses with missiles that maybe were fired at French ships. We're not 100% sure. So it appears Russia is perhaps doing its own private, you know, Operation Prosperity Guardian just for its own ships without, you know, working with the international coalition. But it's an interesting development for sure. You mentioned the Black Sea Fleet, I think such a big consideration for the Russians when they consider Odessa, which is one of their main considerations in the midst of any large-scale advance or offensive in the coming months or year, because again, recognize that they said 2025 is when they want to kind of wrap this thing up, and right now we're still working on that timeline, but we're going to have to see some movement here within the next few months if we want that. But I just think that they're so concerned about the presence of NATO and U.S. and U.K. intelligence over the Black Sea, especially over, the, you know, the region of the Black Sea between Crimea and Odessa, because that's how they've been able to strike so many of the Russian ships is because NATO and some of these entities, whether it's France or the U.K. or, you know, some of these Scandinavian countries, they're able to operate with their spyware and their, their intel plans and their espionage and all of their drones and all these sorts of things. We remember the drone that got, you know, fuel dumped on it by the Russians over the Black Sea. These things are happening everywhere. Those things fly with impunity over regions of the Black Sea and gather so much intelligence. That's why these Ukrainian strikes can still hit Sevastopol frequently and kill people and all of that. So I don't know if Russia's waiting for those to stop being as frequent. Again, we see Romania Black Sea bases being really built up, so I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. Russia's going to have to fight the bullet prop. That's the thing. Putin is insisting he's not going to fight NATO, but I don't see how you invade Odessa without shooting down some NATO hardware out of the sky, or else you're going to have a time. You know, it's a really, it's a really tough situation they're going to be in, of course. But you know, unless you have anything else to say about the future frontline situation in Ukraine, the Black Sea, or any of the the on the ground situation there, we got to talk about the impending. Rafa operation because it appears that the U.S. has quietly acquiesced despite it supposedly being, you know, the red line of basically everybody, Biden, everybody in the West, the Pentagon even, but it seems they've quietly acquiesced, the Israelis and the Jews, they've, they've won, you know, their need to expand greater Israel has won out, I guess, against just the reasonable objections against what is obviously an ethnic cleansing and genocide, so... I've heard of a purchase of, you know, tens of thousands of tents in Gaza, I mean, in Sinai for these Gazans to be placed in upon this escalation. The U.S. apparently is trying to move as many civilians out as possible, but that's 99% of the people are civilians, even if you include the mass Hamas, the max Hamas estimates. I don't understand what that even really means. And this idea that they're just going to go in and start killing people, it's just a low-key tacit admission that they're just going to go in and kill civilians so it's it's a really unfortunate thing that's going to happen and 
I don't know how it's going to play out, frankly. I don't know how many Palestinians are actually going to make it into Sinai. I don't know how many of them are going to just get, you know, wiped out. It's going to be a really unpleasant thing to see, so be sure to keep them all in your prayers. Perhaps Hezbollah will really intervene, and as we've seen, the Israeli military has said to Israeli state media that they are effectively, they already know that they're going to go into Lebanon once the Rafah thing wraps up, so they're basically admitting that this war is going to expand outside of, you know, the immediate vicinity of Palestine. So Hezbollah, they've already been so heavily firing into northern Israel that Israel's completely closed off all access to Kiryat Shmona and some of these towns and towns and regions along the border with Lebanon, so they seem to have already committed to going in, so it seems that this is all a very massive escalation, and we're about to witness probably the biggest escalation in the ethnic cleansing since, you know, the beginning of the operation into Gaza, just a few weeks after October 7th. Yeah, definitely. There's uh, there's a huge wave coming, of course, from the IDF, and they're really, like, they've been positioning like looking at that southern region of Gaza for a while now, of course, probably training their guns, training their weapons. And now at this point, the connection here from what we see with Ukraine and Israel, like what is the one thing that's quite common is that Ukraine, of course, is getting into low quality planes. The Well, low quality, of course, is uh, to be taken with a grain of salt. We're seeing the F-16s that Ukraine is getting, essentially NATO tech. And how can you even tell, you know, speaking about the Black Sea, which plane belongs to NATO and which belongs to Ukraine when they're all essentially the same models flying around. It's just been announced that... Israel is going to get the high-tech planes, the F-35s, 25 of them, actually. The Biden administration has approved the transfer of these uh, fighter jets to Israel. So 25 brand new planes. And of course, you have to think, wait, hold on. Hamas doesn't even have a single helicopter, right? So not, not even speaking about these high-tech fighter jets, which can fly at hundreds of kilometers per hour, and essentially can, you know, sort of bomb targets indiscriminately, right? This is like sci-fi levels of technology here. And what else is being given by the Biden administration? 500 MK-82 500 pound bombs. So 500, 500 pound bombs, right? It's like, well, what are these bombs designated for? Lebanon? Like you have to just bring up some of these examples. Syria, who are they looking to bomb here? Or maybe even they'll just bomb the Palestinian Gazans as they've been doing. And 1,800, 2,000 pound bombs. So the MK-84s. So the Biden administration, despite all of its rhetoric, despite Anthony Blinken flying around to Saudi Arabia and trying to organize some sort of Arabic peace coalition and to stop whatever's taking place between Israel and Palestine at the moment, this genocide, none of it has come to any sort of terms. There is, there's no real fruitful terms of peace between these two sides. And naturally, Netanyahu has been just moved with complete uh, intolerance and ruthlessness at the Palestinians in the south of Gaza. And I just want to mention, like, this is the Wall Street Journal title, right? So their article, US pushes to shape Israel's Rafa operation, not stop it. What does shape Israel's Rafa operation mean even in this scenario when there's more than initially, right? A few months ago, we said 1.5 million people. And at this point, there was more than 2 million people in Rafa at the moment. This is enormous. This is the size of some modern cities, right? How can you filter that population out properly as you move in indiscriminately? And your population, the IDF is at this point has been radicalized to the point where they see Palestinians as subhumans, as essentially targets, right? These people have been radicalized over the last six months. They've been fed all this propaganda, about 40 beheaded babies, about 1,200 Israelis killed. They're prepared to shed Palestinian blood. To let these people into these refugee camps would be an act of, would be a criminal act, a war crime. And I believe Netanyahu is probably willing to do it at this point, to sort of cement this sacrifice to, to take place in in the deserts of southern Israel and southern Palestine. I think that's really what's going to take place. And Kamala Harris isn't going to stop it. Joe Biden's not going to stop it. None of these Western elites. And of course, the bad news, I think, for the Palestinian Arabs and Palestinian Muslims is that their fellow Islamic leaders, the Islamic kings, presidents around the world, especially those of those leaders belonging to the Sunni uh, Islamic uh, sect of you know of Islam, they're not looking to stop this genocide either. Either there's no there are no sanctions. There's no there's no particular actions against U.S. diplomacy. No one is here to stand up for the Palestinians except for the Houthis, except for Iran, and partially I would say not even partially, but probably fully Hezbollah because Hezbollah essentially in Lebanon is fighting its own battle against Israel. It's probably equally as equally as and strongly uh, cemented in its beliefs as the Hamas and Palestinians are. So. It's just the unfortunate reality of Islam, of the fact that Islamic unity was a myth that was fed not just to the Palestinian Arabs, but also, I believe, to the whole world, where they said, well, the Islamic world is united, everybody helps each other. 
that's not the reality here. It's, it seems like Islam is a tool which is used by world powers and those innocent Muslims on the ground who actually believe that there is some sort of oversight from international actors such as Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, these rich Muslim countries, there is no oversight. These people do not care. They're not these international police officers or peacekeepers. They will let you die in this desert and they will not save you when the Israeli bloodthirsty IDF soldiers come into your refugee camp. And I think that's the unfortunate reality. And neither is the nice black lady Kamala Harris. She's not going to save you either. And all that all that aid that's being dropped, those 40 boxes or so, they drop them, they squash people, and this food isn't going to save the hundreds and thousands of children who are starving at the moment because they've reached this point of famine, which, again, we probably haven't seen since some of the African civil wars which took place in the 1970s and 80s. Like, this is just tremendous. It's it's horrible to the point of no return. And look, it's it's only going to get worse. As soon as Netanyahu makes that decision to move the tanks in, to move in the troops on the ground, we're going to see atrocities, which, which probably sh we shouldn't be even viewing. But unfortunately, they're just going to reach us anyway. Now we're going to be praying for all of that. Of course, the Orthodox and the Christian generally population has shrunk to, I believe, below 600 people at this point. So real genocide has occurred there. But, you know, you mentioned the weakness of the Islamic world. I mean, look, the Sunni world, they, they haven't done anything. We realize at this point, if the Saudis wanted to, they could mobilize an army of like 150,000 Indonesians ready to march on Israel at any day or any other random Islamic country from around the world, but they don't want to do that. They would rather work in the international community and work to, you know, modernize their resource, you know, vectors and get their, you know, trade routes aligned properly and everything so they can modernize and all of these sorts of things. That's what they're interested in. Yet somehow, despite the cuckoldry of the Sunni world, the biggest Shabbos Goy country in the Islamic world for Israel still manages to be Azerbaijan, somehow Shia. So... You know, really fascinating development there. I guess the Turkic angle for them matters more to their Shia nature as their number one ally is big brother Sunni Turkey, who, again, we do know is one of the foremost supporters of Hamas. That's part of why they're able to talk so much and, you know, do so much of that verbal support is because Hamas was one of the few, you know, kind of examples in the anti-Israeli sphere that Turkey supported. Turkey has no love for and gets no love from, you know, the axis of resistance. That's, you know, Shia Iran territory. And reports show that Iranian generals are in Yemen, or at least were, and are perhaps conducting plans and making plans for future operations against Israel with the Houthis. So the Iranian influence across the axis of resistance is increasing. And of course, that has to do with the random and dramatic increase in ISIS and ISIS-K presence as they attack all of the U.S.'s enemies across the region, of course. And, you know, their first attack back a few months back in Iran was at Qasem Soleimani's funeral. And again, Qasem Soleimani is the one who created the axis of resistance and made it what it is. So it's been able and is the reason it's been able to counter and confront Israel today. And it seems that the U.S. and Israel, in a way, kind of activated their own quote-unquote axis of resistance, translation, ISIS. And, you know, they've been acting all over. And some in Syria, of course, ISIS-K is apparently even behind the Crocus situation. And we're going to get into some of those details because, you know, the Islamic extremist situation, even in places like Tajikistan, that connects all the way back with Turkey. So all of this really does come together. And ISIS-K, we know that they were active in Balochistan. That was where Iran was striking when they were responding to the terrorist attack, which they blamed on Mossad because they struck a Mossad base in Kurdistan, which we see the U.S. actually seeming to activate some more of its players and send special forces to continue helping and training the PKK, which we know was just designated a terrorist organization in Iran. And some of that, I think, has to do with putting pressure on Turkey and waging a bit of a shadow war against Erdogan, who we know, despite being a NATO member, obviously is against Israel and, you know, is, while not pro-Assad, is also not in favor of a lot of the U.S.-backed factions in Syria as he continues to incur into Syria and perhaps even want to connect with Iraq. We've heard all sorts of talk about this as Erdogan has militarized all sorts of Turkish you know, troops across the axes that he has influenced and he is waging, you know, low-grade warfare in. But like we said, the axis of resistance and the Houthis all the way up to Hezbollah, they are, you know, the primary factor that is threatening Israel and is what they are worried about when they will inevitably, as they say, go into Rafah. And we know that in his first address at the beginning of the conflict, Nasrallah said that if it seems Gaza is truly about to be, you know, brought to its knees, that they will go in, so it appears that 
in the next few weeks, we will likely be getting, you know, ground operations and confrontations between IDF and Hezbollah. And I guess at that point, what matters is, will the rest of Lebanon perhaps join Hezbollah or will they, you know, attack them from the rear and effectively support Israel in the name of quote unquote peace in the name of not dragging them into the war when look, if Israel invades you, you've been dragged into the war, it's time to saddle up and I don't care if it's Hezbollah, you gotta go to war against these Zionists. I think that's how it really needs to be, but you know, we'll we'll see how the Lebanese decide it. But I think the connection with the Crocus Mall is is important here because ISIS K is is relevant across all of these regions and and we know that despite the fact that, you know, they they were Tajiks that were in, who, you know, supposedly Persian in origin and in their background, of course, Tajikistan, they, you know, are known for this ISIS-K group targeting Iran, targeting even Russian-backed groups in the region, and now apparently targeting Russia itself, which is, is very strange. We know, of course, the U.S. immediately announced that Ukraine was not behind this for some reason, you know, really trying to dispel any of that, but it seems that there is a ISIS-Ukraine-US-UK connection. We've seen the ISIS patches on all sorts of people fighting in Ukraine, but we've discussed all of this for a decent amount. Some of the more esoteric angles, however, in the Crocus situation are interesting. We know that the city hall itself was owned by an Azeri Jew, so Dimitri, you may have more of an update on some of that. Some of it is pretty interesting. Yeah, I'm not even sure if we mentioned this detail um, last week, but last week, frankly, we only recorded roughly five to six hours after the tragedy and the terrorist act was announced. So really, we didn't have much information. But like looking at the scenario in and of itself, let's just set things straight and kind of put it, categorize all of these uh, different facts that we have about this tragedy. So the tragedy occurs on right on the eve of, of course, uh, Purim, that Jewish uh, festival, which celebrates, it's mentioned in the book of Esfir, Esther, which celebrates, of course, the uh, Jewish sort of, the Jewish revengeism, the slaughter of Persians uh, in the kingdom of Xerxes uh, in the Old Testament. And of course, this Jewish feast day, usually when it does take place, the feast of Purim, it's usually accompanied by a certain tragedy which takes place somewhere in the world, usually terrorist acts, uh, human tragedies, mass murder, um, something really bad, usually maybe even the beginning of different wars. In this particular case, it seems that as the first star of Saturday came up in the in the sky, uh, or at least at nighttime, because we know the, uh, the Talmudic Jews, they of course count the beginning of the day, as do Orthodox Christians actually, from around 6 p.m., 7 p.m. from the evening, right, which we see in our church services, as the time of course ticked over and the Shabbat began these these four to six tajiks entered into Kroger city hall and began indiscriminately shooting at people with of course loads of ammunition ak-47s indiscriminately cutting the throats of these uh innocent people found in the Kroger city hall and once they've entered the hall itself they then proceeded to the concert uh, theater which again and began shooting people there as well eventually they set off at least one bomb and then they set the theater room on fire in a very specific location because again these modern theaters they, allegedly it was built out of really good material which is again questionable as to the owner of the hall and exactly how much he invested into it we'll have to i mean that's still being investigated as to why why there were no um dampening of fire services like why there was no water actually being sprinkled on some of this man-made fire started by the Tajiks in the hall itself, while why there were no security alarms going off. Some of the doors began automatically locking in the center itself, essentially basically trapping these people in this furnace. A lot of some folks died from the gases from the fire itself. And unfortunately, these Tajiks were not stopped by anybody. In fact, four of them got into a car, and as we know from the official news, they drove unmolested just down south towards Bryansk and even almost to Belarus. If they turned just a bit to the right, they would have reached the Belarusian border, but instead they kept driving essentially directly towards Ukraine and Kharkov through the Bryansk and Belgorod Oblast, and that's where they were stopped by the Russian border guard and the FSB agents. And it's just curious to see, Conrad, because the owner of the Krokus City Hall like we have to really get into the details. It's Aras Agalarov. You know, the last name Agalarov is typically people of a Sephardic origin who come from the city of Agalar in Spain or Agalar. They they are of Sephardic origin. Him being, of course, uh, an alleged Azeri, Azerbaijani, he does have ties to that Azeri community. We know that the Azerbaijani uh, mountain Jew community is very powerful. The Aliyev family is typically, most of the Aliyevs were actually married to mountain Jews. And in fact, probably the Aliyev family itself is very sort of Talmudic and Yiddish in origin. But 
Now, nevertheless, Aras Agalarov, this Russian oligarch, this Russian businessman, builds the Crocus City Hall. He invites Donald Trump to it for one of his Miss, Miss Universe pageants in 2013 before Trump runs for his presidency. So there is also that link that this Crocus City Hall tragedy, again, aligns with Trump and it kind of uh, stains his name, again, in this sort of terrorist act. It's like, well, he's the only president who's ever visited this hall and look, a terrorist act has occurred. So it kind of, uh, as, a, as collateral, it touches Trump's image as well, that Trump was kind of involved in this. And again, I'm not sure if it'll ever come up in, in Trump's future presidency or in the election, but nevertheless, small element here. But Aras Agalar, if, like you may be interested in, who is, who is this oligarch? Did he insure the whole? He did in fact insure it. And the Russian insurance agency, this was an ancient insurance agency, you can almost say, established by Joseph Stalin himself uh, in the 1950s. It has promised to pay out at least $100 million to him. And that doesn't sound like much, but in Russian, it would be tens of billions of, ru of rubles, which translate into Russian it's quite a substantial amount. This was the largest shopping mall in all of Russia at the time when it burnt down uh, just last week. But addition, in addition to that, because it was a terrorist act, there were also government subsidies, which Aras Agalarov will receive. This is after this terrorist act. And it's been revealed that Aras Agalarov, this businessman, also took out credit loans by using uh, his sort of net worth as sort of security to take out this loan from a Russian bank. So we're talking about he's made almost, you know, is he's triple dipped in this tragedy and he'll be he'll be receiving a lot more money once the insurance payout comes and it's always almost like a larry silverstein type of example where larry silverstein invested in the world trade center twin towers twin towers project and again he may receive a massive payout of four four and a half billion dollars well after the 9 11 tragedy occurred so again it's just a really weird connection there and what is the other kabad connection which we spoke about on twitter quite a bit that is the fact that aras agalarov has married a very interesting Jewish lady. Her name is Irene, and she comes from a very esteemed family. Her father, Joseph, is very involved in the Kabbadic community. In fact, he sponsored personally the writing of the Hasidic Kabbad Jewish Encyclopedia. So Joseph Grill is his name. And so Joseph Grill was a massive member of the Kabbad. And these are people who built the tunnels a few months ago, who made all the headlines. Joseph sponsored this massive encyclopedia project for the Jews in both English and Russian. So again, this wonderful magnate of culture, right? And Aras Agalarov marries his daughter and they have a son. The son's name is Emin, so he's essentially, typically by Jewish law, he's considered also a Jew. I'm not sure if he has an Israeli citizenship, but Emin is this famous singer. He's visited Tel Aviv, and he's visited Israel multiple times, singing as a member of this conjoined Azeri-Israeli tradition. It's just a very curious sort of connection here. Again, the Kabbalah is typically strongly involved, and the other weird connection, right, Conrad, there's two elements of occultism here. It's the band that played at Crocus City Hall. Right. Who would play? And I mean, firstly, who would even allow for a concert such as this to play a satanic band during Great Lent? I mean, unfortunately, Russia still is a secular state, so it does allow these sort of things to take place. But who would visit it? Why would you place yourself in such danger? These questions, again, arise because the, the group Picnic, which is which was playing at Crocus City Hall, was allegedly planning to take the stage before the terrorist act took place. They're not just some random Illuminati Freemason satanic band in Russia. They are the most Illuminati-based satanic and Freemasonic group in all of Russia combined, because Russia doesn't have that many satanic rock bands, as you would imagine. Most of them kind of went uh, extinct in the in the 1990s. They kind of lost popularity. But this, but this band Picnic has very, very deep Freemasonic Illuminati imagery, even going back to the Canaanites, their main symbol. I've, you know, some people were claiming it's Moloch or Baal. It's actually Ishtar, the, god, the ancient goddess, the pagan demonic goddess you hear about in the Old Testament, Astarta, Ishtar. That is their main symbol. You can see the inverted crescent on top of her head, kind of forming these two horns, the glowing eyes. It matches exactly to the ancient depictions of Ishtar and all these other Levantine, Le Lebanese, Phoenician artworks. Why are they using an ancient pagan goddess as their symbol? Again, very bizarre. But this group, Picnic, the main singer, the, the main singer of it is allegedly of Polish Jewish roots as well. Again, it's a bizarre connection. And the query rises, Conrad. It's like who, who's involved? Who benefits from this act? It's it's clearly it clearly has some occult roots in it. There's a clearly occult sort of details involved in this murder. But at the same time, we have Zelensky, Budanov. The Kabad, which runs the Ukraine, also involved because, again, someone needed to hide these Tajiks and also set them on, on this Russian Crocus City Hall to kill indiscriminately all these innocent people. So there's this double connection. It's almost like the Kabad inside of Russia used this terrorist act as a ritual sacrifice for themselves to participate and to kind of accommodate their needs before the, before the eve of Putyam. And 
the Kabat in Ukraine benefited because it destabilized Russia domestically as well as geopolitically, because at the same time, Putin, the pressure's on him now. He has to somehow address this terrorist act. He has to, you know, begin and push the SMO to the next level. And suddenly Russia's affected on multiple levels negatively, especially during such a sort of difficult time during the SMO. Well, and I hear they perhaps wanted to goad Russia into responding in Ukraine so strongly that the Western countries like France and Poland and even the UK perhaps are basically forced somehow by public opinion to uh, to respond and to put troops on the ground in Ukraine. But I mean, again, many are saying the troops are already on the ground in a lot of ways. Of course, we see the Romania boosting. We see the French troops in Romania. We see the pol we see the Poles, you know, leaving these treaties, allowing themselves to build up effectively their army at will. So a lot of things like that are going down to the point where we can see why perhaps Ukraine could have had a hand in this and getting these Tajiks to do this disgusting act. But Dimitri, I don't think we were completely done with the esoteric nature of all of this. You mentioned the disgusting band and you mentioned, you know, the roots of, you know, the, the Silverstein nature of some of this. You mentioned the you know, that the fire itself should not have been able to rage for as long as it was and totally destroy the building, you know, totally ensuring both no real investigation can be done into the initiation of the of the attack as well as completely ensuring maximum insurance payout. So interesting development there. But there's another ritual aspect to this involving, you know, the removal of a of a Tajik's ear. I think there was some very interesting symbolism there if you wanted to go into that for the audience as well. Yeah, that's an interesting discussion because, again, the footage of the ear being cut off and, of course, displayed and the knife that cut off the ear being displayed as this tool of sort of veneration in a bizarre fashion. I'm not saying that this Tajik deserved any better. All I'm saying is the symbolism here is undeniable. So if you read the Book of Esper and you read about the, the ears of the Persians being cut off, right, by the Persian king as a punishment, it's it's almost as if someone either the fsb agent or whoever cut this ear off was it the border guard was was the border guard jewish was he russian was the fsb agent russian or was he maybe a mem member of the talmudic uh, sect we're not sure we don't have any of these answers and in fact it's just coincidental because the tajiks are not just turkic or arab they're actually persian themselves so there's a complete alignment here with the purim story in the old testament to what took place the ear of a persian was literally cut off and shown all over not just alternative media but also mainstream media he even had like you know the bandage around his ear when he appeared in russian court so it's just this weird um you know like a signaling like a ritualistic signaling like look the ear of a persian was cut off on the eve of Purim. like what does that even mean <laughs> like i'm i'm not even sure if if that's someone's trying to mock mock the Talmudic tradition, or if it's someone, or if the Russians, in fact, have certain plants within their own sacred services who are, in fact, signaling, like, look, you know, showing the Kabad something, but what exactly are they trying to show? In any in any case, the knife, right, that was used to cut off the ear, and I'm sorry we're going into these sort of gory details here, but it's just, in this world that we live in, unfortunately, this is these are the things that take place, right? They get shown all over social media, but the knife that was used to cut off the ear was called the spike knife, and it looks... Conrad noticed this, but the knife looks identical to the uh, the copier, the spear tool that the clergy used, the liturgy, to prepare the body of Christ for communion. So that little spear that we all have on the altar table in our local parishes and churches in the Orthodox Church, I mean, couldn't you find a different knife? Like, why, is, why does the knife have to look like that? Again, like, I'm not an expert on knives. Maybe that's just a commonplace. But he showed it, and he said, this is the, the guard that allegedly cut the ear off. He said, look, I'm going to sell this knife online. And it's almost like a symbol of veneration, this new spear of longinus, you know? Like, what do we look like? It was getting really esoteric. It's almost like the hammer of Wagner, you know? This Like, we're getting into this new realm of, like, esoteric uh, semi-paganism, maybe even Talmudic. I'm not quite sure how to how to interpret this but yes the ears of haman which is even a like the the druze they bake these little pies and cookies and these are the ears of the persians which they consume on the eve of Purim. and then we have the ear of a tajik persian being cut off on live television being shown to everyone it's like and and also why why are they showing us this in the first place i've never seen a special like after any i guess u.s shooting i've never seen firsthand sort of footage this hd of like terrorists being essentially apprehended or even shown footage of them being tortured things like that maybe it's to scare any future you know terrorists from striking but perhaps there's deeper symbolism here I, i'm not quite sure and no, no i'm not making excuses for i'm not saying torture is bad or anything there are extraordinary cases where interrogation for these methods is completely justified and it would be hypocritical to say that it isn't because again 
even Orthodox countries in the past have used torture as this tool. And I'm not saying it's like a good thing, but it was necessary in certain cases to get information out of people, especially criminals such as these four Tajiks. But the Tajiks themselves, like they raise another query, like esoterically speaking, like who hired them? Allegedly, they came from Turkey. In their in their little um, preliminary interviews, Conrad, they mentioned they were telegram they were messaged on Telegram by this Imam who began preaching to them, and then the Imam had a friend. And I'm just wondering, does that friend of the Imam who later told them to, you know, to essentially organize this terrorist act, did he wear like a kippah or a, you know a tall black hat or anything? Like, who is this friend of the Imam which they keep speaking about but never naming? It's just hopefully the Russian federal service will kind of get that information out of them. But yeah, this this sort of ritualistic uh, nature of the of this essentially terrorist act is kind of unavoidable at this point. All the details can probably be found on my Twitter page, actually. You can just have a look at it. There's some, some of the photos and information. And of course, the, the last sort of haunting detail, which I think is worth mentioning, is the fact that the Picnic City group, on the advertisement for that Crocus City Hall performance, which took place that night, they had a hanging man. And as we know, the hanging man aligns with the letter from the Hebrew alphabet, the 12th letter, which is Lamed. This letter has has a meaning as well like letters in the hebrew alphabet such as they're like hieroglyphs so they have certain meanings well, one of them is learning and the other meaning of this letter lamed and the hanging man this sort of symbology is sacrifice specifically ritual sacrifice lamed was one of the letters used in the party of house murder of the romanov royal family so there was four hebrew letters on the wall left by one of the talmudic bolsheviks one of those letters was lamed we see lamed essentially as the hanging man on the poster for that picnic group night. Um, so again, it's just really dark. We're not sure what happened to these innocent people. In the end, more than you know, close to 150 people passed away. There's a lot of people in trauma in the ICU recovering in Russian hospitals. Everyone's praying. Russian patriarch has announced that he's praying for everybody. Every single monastery in Russia at the moment is praying for the victims, those who have passed away and those who are now recovering in hospital from severe, really detrimental military-grade injuries caused by these Tajiks and whoever ordered them. Because again, imagine the people who ordered these particularly Islamic terrorists. This is not even about Islamic terrorism in and of itself. It's who has the sort of dark plans to institute such an event. You know, who has the plans to send these criminals, these psychopaths into, into action. And again, the Russian chief of the FSB, Lavrov, President Putin, they've pointed towards the CIA and, and the SBU. But I think it goes a little bit deeper. I believe probably the one link which is connecting all of these dots is the Kabad, the Hasidic sect, which again runs and has all of these little elements and the cliques in all these various countries, including Moscow, unfortunately, in which they could have planned this event ahead of time. It could have been both a destabilizing event in Russia, geopolitically and domestically, as well as a ritual sacrifice. They could have just, you know, it's just multiple goals through through uh, sort of one event. And as we know, Zelensky, Kolomoisky, these people are Kabad run as well, and the CIA in, in, in the US. What can I even say about the US elites? They're deeply tied to some of these banking elites as well. So it's just very unfortunate that innocent Russians needed to suffer. And we know they were Russian because 96.5% of the people who died in this conflict were actually ethnic white Russian European people. So most were probably Orthodox Christians as well. So again, thoughts and prayers of those who suffered and those who passed away prematurely and were victims of this massive terror attack. And the investigation continues, but I think it was very apt for us to give this breakdown because this information will be lost in the next few months and a lot will be covered up, but I think it just needs to be put out on record that this is this wasn't a simple, weird Islamic terror attack, or not even ISIS-K. It goes a little bit deeper than that. Quite sure. There is a real level of the real politique and the intelligence game and the different factions and you know the different regions of conflict and where extremists can come from and where militants can be sourced from. But at the same time, transcending that, playing both sides, initiating things inside different factions, especially in intelligence communities across both sides of the spectrum, across all conflicts around the world are, you know, these sort of Jewish mystics, these wizards that play both sides and initiate rituals that we're all then forced to participate in through the media. I mean, look, after the, like you pointed out, the spear that looks like the communion knife was used to cut off the guy's ear, thousands of the same knife and similar looking knives were being sold across you know, internet exchanges across Russia and everything. So thinking about it from a from a magical, you know, ritualistic perspective, you know, they 
they they chose a sigil, you know, they conducted a ritual as it were with the ear, like kind of echoing the the written word as it were in their historical grievance narrative, and they you know they then had this symbol as the knife, and then they charged the sigil with you know having it be purchased over an exchange. You know, I know we're kind of schizo maxing here, but this is this is the level of <laughs> these are the level of uh, degrees to which these groups go to really you know shift reality, manipulate reality, you know, perform alchemical transmutations and sort of get their way in world affairs and controlling meta narratives and broader civilizational understandings. So it's it's quite the interesting thing to observe and of course we'll see how it affects the broader conflict. We'll see if it does, if that was the purpose, or perhaps it may have something to do with these red heifers, because this is an even more overt ritual that seems to be about to be about to be committed. They've got all of these red heifers that apparently have been bred in Texas, and there's this there's this altar that has sort of been hastily constructed for practical purposes on the Mount of Olives overlooking, you know, the Dome of the Rock, you know, and they're going to do this in the anticipation that it will be destroyed, and they, they're claiming all of these things about those anointed with the ashes of these sacrificed heifers will be granted permanent access to the Temple Mount, and be able to go into Al-Aqsa Mosque and basically do the same rituals and prayers that those rabbis that stormed the mosque right before Operation Al-Aqsa Flood. I mean, this is exactly the reason that Hamas even cited that they started October 7th and did all of these things. So it's it's an extremely interesting development, and it seems that it's the Temple Institute and many of these other radical groups that also support settlers in the West Bank and previously in Gaza and future in southern Lebanon. There have been settler groups having all these big meetings and you know, raising money and gathering weapons for future settlements in southern Lebanon. So again, we talked about the military talking about going in there. It seems pretty clear what the plan is. So in conjunction with creating Greater Israel, they are about to start sacrificing these heifers. There's there's claims that this is the first red heifer sacrifice since, you know, the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. So if that's true, I don't have the 100% veracity on that. But these heifers have supposedly been bred and selected in a certain way. There's all these prophecies about how it can't have been leaned on, it can't have been yoked. Of course, every single hair apparently has to be read. They have to inspect it. And they got some freaking Texas, I'm sure, ultra-Zionist evangelical, I think he even went to freaking Texas A&M, freaking Aggies, always the stupid Aggies. But they had him to make these red heifers, I guess, and they are somewhere in Israel protected you know, being protected for this ritual to take place. And some of the first ones I hear are going to be at the very beginning of April as some of these Jewish holidays and some of these things start to occur as we get closer to Jewish Passover, which, of course, on the original old, you know, Orthodox calendar, we know that has to, we always, the Jews always have their Passover, and there's a rule that we never celebrate the resurrection at the same time as or before the the Jews celebrate their, you know, Satanic Passover. So they say that this is going to happen and that, then we may be seeing some dramatic escalations in the region as well as eschatologically if this goes through and this is, you know, truly the the satanic ritual that they say it's going to be. So it's very interesting. Rituals abounding, to say the least, you know. Maybe these days are, maybe, you know, as Seraphim Rose said, it is later than we think. Yeah, absolutely. And look, it affects not just not just us, but it affects everybody. Uh, we participate in God's grace every time we attend the liturgy on a weekly basis, every time we go to Vespers, Matins on a Saturday night, on a weekly basis, right? Just like Orthodox Lady, you attend church twice a week, you recharge, the Lord grants you his blessings, and then you continue on with your week living out in this difficult world. And of course, these people have their own have their own objectives. They also seek the Lord's grace, but through the back door. And in fact, the grace that they're receiving is not from not from God, not from the Holy Trinity, but in fact from various demons and false idols which they worship and venerate. And this slaying of the five red heifers on the Mount of Olives, again, this really negative symbolism overlooking the Temple Mount as well. And notice the Mount of Olives, for those of you in the Russian Orthodox Church outside of Russia, Rokor, you know that the Mount of Olives um, and the uh, the, the monastery on top of the Mount of Olives, in fact, that's the mountain of ascension uh, from which Christ rose up to heaven. And he, when he told the apostles that he'll be coming back during the end times, the last place where Christ, uh, where Christ stood, of course, on the on, the, on the earth was on that particular mount. And that is the headquarters of Rokor's mission, which uh, has given us so, so many great fruits throughout the decades. And, you know, you can say well, more than a century at this point since the time of the Russian Empire, which we covered in our eight for hour Palestine episodes worth looking into. But that is the mountain where they're going to sacrifice these animals. And, you know, just like the Tajik is Islamist sort of ordered by the Kabad terrorists who are cutting the throats 
of the Russians in that in that Kroger City Hall professionally. These professional rabbis are going to slice the throats of these these animals and sacrifice them to false idols to essentially bring about the time of the Antichrist, which is what they want. So again, it's just really dark. No one's going to stop it because they've disarmed they've disarmed the majority of Hamas fighters. They've occupied them. So notice how it's almost like the timing is just perfect. They've had a ritual sacrifice take place during Purim in the third Rome, right, in Russia, Moscow. They've had Hamas almost completely destroyed at this point, or at least pushed back to the point where Hamas is somewhat preoccupied. They cannot stop the sacrifice from taking place. They've had the Orthodox Church suppressed and harassed in Palestine and Israel to the point where I don't think any Orthodox Christians inside of Israel will be you know, opposing or protesting against this. Not at this time, at, at this moment, it's just a little bit too tough. And also, you know, they're just looking towards summoning their Moshiach so he can destroy Rome. And notice, as world history has shown, the way these Talmudic rabbis and their religion, they view Rome and they view, they view Russia as actually the third Rome, as the successor of this Christian Roman Empire who during the reign of Constantine, Theodosius the Great, Justinian, Emperor Heraclius, who has suppressed their Jewish drive to build this third temple. They view us Orthodox Christians as the sort of diaspora, even in uh, countries outside of Russia, as the diaspora of, of the Roman Empire. Like they even view us as secularly as they do view us religiously as their enemies. It's not, it, regardless of how Semitic or philo Semitic we are, that's how they view us. They view us as enemy spies, as people who need to be done away with. That's just who we as Orthodox Christians are, apparently, in their eyes. They don't view us as simple Christians. They view us as the target, the enemy, which is why we face various troubles throughout the decades from these particular people. And it's just really tragic that now the world is you know, on the brink of the Third World War and these people are engaging in such uh, really dark rituals. It's not going to bring about anything good. And it just we just have to pray for the Christians in Palestine and, and in you know the sort of state-occupied Israel territory because they're going to be facing, they're going to be at the, at the forefront of the construction of this new Talmudic Zionist entity, which will probably go beyond just the current borders of Israel. I think that this is the greater Israel expansion point, both religiously as well as in a secular fashion as they move into southern Lebanon, Syria, and begin occupying more and more territory. It's a really dark phase of world history, and these people are accelerating it. You know, they speak about accelerationism from the right. This is accelerationism, but from below, from like the depths of hell, right? They're moving history in the wrong direction. But God still has the reins of history. He still controls and he permits evil to take place. And perhaps the Lord will slow down this particular corruption in this area in order to give us some breathing room to actually collect ourselves, you know, piously, ask for forgiveness, repent, and maybe give us a little bit more time in order to build up our families and strengthen ourselves before the coming tribulations. Now, there's a chance this this could be a dud attempt. We know that Metropolitan Yofitos talks about this, that the Israelis, the Zionists, you know, they really want to goad the U.S. into striking Iran preemptively to hitting their nuclear program, because I think the Jews are afraid that Iranians have already in some way underground weaponized nukes, because we know the Israelis have an entire secret nuclear arsenal, so that's how that all goes. And Metropolitan Yofitos talks about how the Jews and, you know, perhaps the West may strike Iran in that regard, and that's you know, that's Israel and the Zionists trying to ensure that this project that they're doing to, you know, slaughter these heifers and do these sacrifices and these rituals and destroy the Dome of the Rock and ultimately rebuild the Third Temple and usher in the Antichrist, they're trying to ensure that any of their regional, you know, non-Kahanist, non-Jewish maximalist, you know, Zio supremacist neighbors, you know, like Shia Iran or any of these places can strike them with any kind of weapons that could destroy this temple project or anything like that. So that's a big part of this. And just on a, just a final note on the kind of broader ritual with among the, you know, the Russian crocus attack. Of course, we know the FSB, they immediately announced that the person who cut off the ear, they couldn't be identified because they're wearing a mask, you know, kind of a wink, wink, nudge, nudge response to not holding that person accountable again and like you said i'm not against sending a message to people i think anybody is in favor of any kind of broad punishment and public you know shaming of somebody that would do such an atrocious act but again we know the fsb in many of these ways they've been they could perhaps be one of these entities that is that takes part in some of these broader rituals and things that go on we know that they had the jerzinski statue put up in front of you know the former kgb kgb headquarters you know so there's a bit of a talmudic connection there still so it's a very interesting question to say the least but as far as the heifers and everything go 
I, I, of course, have talked about the former head of the Temple Institute talking about right at the beginning of October 7th and all of this, how, you know, the Goyim need to worship all the Jews and everything, and this is all still very much part of the discourse with Candace Owens and the Daily Wire and everything like that coming and spilling over into the... We have our a recent episode with Anthony of Westgate on Ether Hour about the Christ is King discourse and all of that, and it really seems to be that this is coming to the forefront even in you know, the normie sphere of things. So even if this isn't, you know, the one and these sacrifices are, you know, ultimately still just a indication that people are getting more and more serious about this project, even in Zionist Israel, I think it's uh, it's definitely a sign of the times, to say the least. Yeah, that's right. Like what we're seeing uh, take place in Israel is really not unique. It's been attempted many times before in the Islamic Ottoman uh, Caliphate. Like there have been attempts to sort of subvert it from the inside to have a certain maybe third temple built on the Temple Mount. There have been projects probably within some of the occult elements of the of the Crusades, right? We're looking at the Knights Templar being involved in some of these weird uh, archaeological digs, possibly searching for some of these lost artifacts from the Second Temple on the Temple Mount itself, and naturally, we we have the best example, which is the Julian the Apostate, who was uh, not just this weird pagan who wanted to return to tradition, but he was in fact slaughtering Christians, torturing them, martyring. There's so many martyrs who we can actually trace back to Julian, and he he attempted to, as the Shabbos Goy that he was. Funny enough, this is where most extreme pagans who slaughter Christians and destroy Christianity from the inside. He burnt, of course, the the relics and destroyed the relics of Saint Elisha the prophet. And he destroyed most of the relics of St. John the Baptist, which is insane because St. John the Baptist was the most highly esteemed man to have ever lived after Christ, which was Christ's words himself. And the only remains we have from St. John the Baptist there is, is his head and his right hand, which was saved by believers. And the rest of the body was destroyed by Julian. And Julian's project was, of course, as you may know, uh, our listeners, was to build the third temple for the Jewish community in the 300s AD, in 360s AD, uh, during our uh, post the reign of Constantine the Great. Just really weird that obviously that didn't take place. God stopped it. There was tornadoes, earthquakes. There was fire coming out of the ground near the Temple Mount of Jerusalem, which prevented some of these constructs from taking place. Almost, you can say, natural, godly, Old Testament type disasters, which prevented this iniquity from occurring. But what will take place now? Now we have, you know, active still active forces resisting the Satanism in the in in you know in Palestine from Hezbollah and even from Iran and some of these uh, forces such as Assad. So there is still hope in the horizon. I would say from our sort of secular, maybe Muslim potential allies as well. And you can say, well, why are you allying with Muslims against the these particular Talmudic elements? Well, it's not like we're allying ourselves with them, but I think all humans made in the image of God can sense, I think internally, Conrad, that something wrong is taking place here. Despite their maybe, of course, false religion of Islam and some of their confusions internally, I think they feel that themselves that Whatever's happening in Israel at the moment really is really bad. And, you know, potentially, yes, it will not take place. But even reaching a point where they're thinking about the possibility of it actually occurring, I think is already bad. These people have the arrogance to actually cause some of these rituals, ritual sacrifices in Moscow, in places like Ukraine, kill Orthodox priests, things like that. They're maybe willing to go ahead with a ritual like this. It really shows the level of deterioration that w the world has come to where these people are doing it in the open. And I think it's um, it's a question of arrogance, it's a question of false confidence, and maybe the Lord will punish them for it. About to start wrapping it up here, you know, we've talked about most of the things on the menu today. Briefly got to mention the Caucasus. It seems that the Armenians are perhaps moving their military into the Tavush region, which Pashinyan claimed that they need to start giving up exclaves and giving up villages and other parts of that region lest Turkey invade them in conjunction with Azerbaijan. So... Perhaps they're moving some forces in there to at least maybe put up a pretense of fighting if Azerbaijan moves in again. So we're going to be watching the Caucasus closely. The only other thing I really have in my notes to discuss was the U.S. bridge collapsing, the Francis Scott Key Bridge. Obviously, pretty symbolic that the author of the national anthem, you know, his bridge is destroyed by a boat operated by Pajits. And then the, uh, you know, the interesting, let's just say, you know, the the hip hop individual, you know, the this character of the Baltimore mayor comes out and he's talking and it's like he's doing his high school post game basketball interview, but you know, then he goes on and threatens white people on the news. So it's really just a solid American story, you know, really not much more commentary needed. But yeah, the only other tragedy we need to talk about is the continued persecution of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church. Of course, 
uh, the lawyer for the UOC, one of the only people that will still, you know, openly represent them and give them good legal counsel, Robert Amsterdam. He's been on Tucker Carlson. Maybe if you saw that interview, he's openly called on the ecumenical patriarch to do the right thing and make his voice heard and, you know, defend the UOC, even if he won't, you know, recognize them as canonical, at least say that their persecution and the burning of their churches and the arresting of their bishops and the assaulting of their people is wrong. But unfortunately, Robert, I'm not holding my breath. I don't think that Patriarch Bartholomew is going to go down that path. I think he's really made his bed in that regard. So it's really unfortunate to see, but it's glad to see that somebody at least is still standing up for the UOC. You know, we've seen more church burnings and whatnot recently. So Dimitri, unless you have anything else to say in that regard, you know, let's hear your last words and then we'll wrap this thing up. Yeah, I just think in terms of prayers, we've recently heard about the kidnapping and the forced conscription of two Ukrainian Orthodox priests. So, of course, members of the canonical church of the Hutsk uh, diocese in Ukraine. So these are Archpriest Father John Petichel. Father John, being an archpriest, who was a quite a senior member of his diocese, he was actually the treasurer of the diocese fund. He was in his early 40s, had three children. All three of his kids are not even teenagers yet, and yet he was forcefully basically kidnapped from his house and conscripted. Nobody knows where he is. Um, his bishop is praying for him. So Father John Petichel is currently essentially unknown. He could be dead. He could be harassed, being violated, assaulted. Who knows where he is? But he's essentially taken captive by the Ukrainian military. And the other priest from that diocese as well, Father John Rosman, also uh, not an archpriest, but just a junior priest from that same diocese as well, fell under that conscription guideline over the age of 30, you know, physically fit. Is he a priest? Is he a clergyman? They don't care. They just, you know, so pray for both Father Johns, I would say, at the moment, because both of them are, and these they were both taken during the mar month of March. And naturally, of course, Patriarch Bartholomew, none of these figures of authority in the church, you know, in the church on, on the sort of left wing of the spectrum are going to speak out about these uh, priests who are essentially being, uh, you know, being taken being taken away from their families, from their loved ones and their parishes. It's just a tragedy. So keep them in your prayers as well as all the other victims of, of the New World Order who we mentioned on our show today from various countries. Of course, as the, this world conflict expands, I think we'll be seeing a lot more unfortunate situations take place in various uh, various areas of the globe. But that's part of the benefit of the show, Conrad, is we get to cover most of these major events in a very Christian, and we try to do it in an unbiased fashion, but naturally some of these events really... Um, get us quite passionate, such as the Crocus City Hall Occult Terror Act. That's very true. And with all of that, you know, like you said, keep all of the people in Ukraine and Palestine in your prayers. Like you said, it's Lent, so I hope everybody is doing their best to keep the fast and, you know, strengthen their prayers in that regard as well. I know that the frequent services are helping me stay strong in all things because, you know, I miss meat like everybody else i want everybody to keep our young friend nico in your prayers i know we've reminded everybody every episode but you know he's you know he, he listens to the show and we appreciate it so everybody keep praying for him because you know his family there they help us and we're they're big fans as well so we want to show the appreciation because you know everybody needs you know the prayers at this time because you know because lent you know it's a hard time even for those that are you know taking joy in the in the fast and everything it can be it can be a tough time for everybody but with all of that, you know, be sure to listen to our most recent Ether Hour episode with Anthony of Westgate. It's a fantastic show. I think it's gotten some pretty good, some pretty good reception from the audience. So be sure to check that out. It'll be linked below whether you're here on Substack or YouTube. But regardless of where you listen, be sure to subscribe at worldwarnow.co, worldwarnow.substack.com. Also, work get your email in there. Get behind the paywall. It supports the show. You get access to 35 plus Ether Hour episodes as well as some fantastic articles amazing translations that Dimitri's been working on with more to come so be sure to stay up to date with that follow us on Twitter at World War Now underscore subscribe to the YouTube channel hit the bell so it, you get a notification if we go live or if we post a video or a clip or anything like that uh, leave a comment there and like the videos it really helps us out follow me on Twitter at GnomeRad follow Dimitri at OCanonist be sure to follow us on Rumble. We've got a channel there as well. Obviously, follow us on Telegram, World War Now, Telly. We do a lot of things there as well. So follow us across all these platforms, and it'll really help us out. We always want people to be making clips of our videos. We've seen some so far, and we really appreciate it. So thank you so much, and everybody, I hope you continue to have a great Lent. And with all of that, God bless. We'll see you next time.